Hi everybody, it's your human anatomy and physiology teacher, Mr. Poser. Today we are going to, I might have said this in the last video, but this is gonna be the last video of our unit in the skeletal system. And we're gonna cover three different things today. We're gonna cover cartilage, we're gonna cover joints, and we're gonna cover motions that are made by joints. All right, so we're really not getting into bones as much anymore. So we probably spent the last couple weeks covering the appendicular skeleton and the axial skeleton and figuring out which bones are where. Um, but in this video, we're really going to get focused on what's between the bones and what kind of what, what kind of stuff happens when they move, all right? So that's what's gonna be going on in this video today. So our first topic is on cartilage. And I may have mentioned this before, but cartilage is really still prevalent in the skeletal system. It's not just bone. Um, and you have a lot of cartilage when you're a baby and you know you get less and less of it as you grow up, but cartilage still maintains a very important role in not only the skeletal system, but in the respiratory system. And while we won't get too far into this today, uh, you can see you got cartilage all over your body, your ribs, uh, at the, each end of your long bone, your ears, your nose, your epiglottis, uh, and particularly in your respiratory system as well. Okay, And we've got three different kinds of cartilage that we can see um, color-coded on this diagram here. We have hyaline cartilage, which seems to be the most common, which is in blue. Uh, elastic cartilage, which is green, so your ear and your epiglottis. And then there's fibrocartilage, uh, which is labeled in red. So your pubis symphysis and intervertebral discs um, are made up of what's called fibrocartilage. So let's talk about each of these types of cartilage. The first one, as I mentioned previously, it's called hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage kind of means glassy or smooth. That's because if you look at it underneath a microscope, it does look kind of glassy and smooth. It's almost like shiny a little bit. Um, as I said, it's the most abundant, and where you can find it is the articular cartilage at the end of the long bone, you know, reduces friction between joints. Costal cartilage connects your ribs to your sternum, as we saw in our axial skeleton video. Um, in the respiratory system, your larynx and your trachea are composed of a lot of hyaline cartilage as well, because, you know, if there was a change, in, the, your respiratory works on um, changes in air pressure, and if, you know, if this wasn't reinforced by cartilage, it'd be all floppy, and then it would collapse, so that's not good. And then finally, your tip of your nose is uh, hyaline cartilage as well. Of course, you have a nasal bone up here. I've got a particularly big one. But uh, yeah, the tip of your nose is hyaline cartilage as well. Elastic cartilage is flexible. That is spelled wrong. It is flexible. And it's really only located in two spots, your ears, your outside ears, and your epiglottis, which is a flap that prevents food from going down your trachea. Um, it prevents you from choking. Pretty helpful, right? Um, and then the third kind is called fibrocartilage, and fibrocartilage is tough. It can withstand a lot of different pressure. Um, so it's really reinforced with collagen fibers, which are the toughest kind of fiber that there is. You can find a lot of collagen in your bones, for example, and that's one of the things that makes bones pretty tough. But anyway, fibrocartilage, um, it's located in the menisci of the knee. So your meniscus, if you've ever heard of that in your knee, it's a layer of fibrocartilage that um, withstands pressure at the bottom of your femur at the, what would that be, the inferior end of your femur, distal end of your femur. Um, and it withstands a lot of pressure. Same with your intervertebral discs. So in between each of your 26 vertebrae, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a layer of uh, fibrocartilage that's designed to withstand lots of different pressure because, you know, gravity's weighing down on you all the time um, and it's pressing your back down a lot. So fibrocartilage is really, really helpful for that. Um, as far as bone binders, these are this is this page is kind of in a misleading spot because these are actually not made of cartilage. They're made of another type of connective tissue called dense regular connective tissue. Um, but I do need you to know the difference between tendons and ligaments here. Uh, and what are they? Well, they are yeah, they're what bind bones to bones or bones to muscles, which is both extremely important. So tendons are used to attach muscle to the bones. Um, so the most famous tendon you might have heard of is called your Achilles tendon, right? Um, it's the back of your it's the back of your leg, okay? And the Achilles tendon connects the gastrocnemius, which is the main calf muscle, to your heel or your calcaneus. Um, so if that's severed, that's ugh, ugh, big big deal, bad, yeah. Um, anyway, that's your Achilles tendon. Tendons attach muscles to bone, while ligaments are used to hold bones together at joints. So another very famous ligament is called the ACL, the anterior cruciate ligament. And the ACL, what it does on the anterior side of the leg, it connects the tibia to the femur. All right, so it's right there in your knee. And it sucks. 
it sucks. It's not a good ligament. There's a whole reasons for that, but we don't have time for that today. All right, so let's talk about joints. Let's get into joints. Uh, we got three main different kinds of joints. Joints are areas of contact between or uh, or near contact between bones. Each has some form of connective tissue to bridge the gap between bones, and they're classified into three major categories. All right, so joints aren't just uh, the kind that move. There's joints that don't move because the definition of joint is any point of contact between uh, between bones. All right. Uh, so we're going to look at cartilaginous and fibrous joints here in a minute, and they're kind of going to go against the notion of what you might think a joint is. Uh, synovial joints are the most common and the ones that we know the most about, and we'll be, we'll be talking about the most too. All right, so as I just said, synovial joints are the most common of all the joints. They're separated by a cavity. It's called the synovial cavity. Um, adjoining bones are covered in a layer of cartilage, and they are stabilized by ligaments. So this kind of joint is covered in a layer of cartilage, again, hyaline cartilage, and it's stabilized by ligaments, like what we were just talking about. All right, so synovial joints are the kinds that move as well. You have synovial joints all over any part of your skeleton that can move. Um, and here's the thing about synovial joints. Okay? Uh, they're characterized by having a capsule of fluid, or it's a capsule of connective tissue that's filled with a fluid. It's called synovial fluid that surrounds the bone of the joint. Okay? That fluid and the articular cartilage um, in that, that capsule really makes sure that joints are as frictionless as possible. Okay? We're trying to avoid friction because A, um, you know, that would hurt, and B, that would be friction generates heat. You feel like this and your hands get warmer, right? Friction generates heat, um, and that would be no good for your joints as well. Um, so that's, that, that's the thing about synovial joints is that there's, a, there's this fluid in there. Okay? And what happens... Fluid, uh, this, this builds up some carbon dioxide and that actually forms a bubble. So anytime you crack your knuckles, all you're doing is you're popping those bubbles that are in your synovial cavities um, and it's not going to give you arthritis. All right, I would read all this down here, but we're going to get to it in a little bit, so we got to keep moving. Cartilaginous joints are characterized by cartilage filling the space in between bones. Only slight movement is possible. So cartilaginous joints are characterized by like, oh, that's weird. Um, the vertebrae and the ribs. All right, so this is what I was talking about before. There's some fibrocartilage that make up intervertebral discs. Um, so here's, um, uh, this doesn't look like real vertebrae, but um, this brown, these brown layers here, these are representing fibrocartilage, which are absorbing a lot of shock um, that your back might take on a, uh, on a regular day. All right, um, so those are cartilaginous joints. They allow for slight slight movement, okay? Not like a synovial joint. All right, and I'm, seems like I'm missing a page here. Okay, that's odd. Um, anyway, <laughs> fibrous joints, okay? Fibrous joints are completely immovable. Let's put that down here. Fibrous joints are completely immovable. All right, so some examples are sutures, in your skull, okay, so we looked at the sutures um, on the cranium, so the coronal suture, lateral suture, lambdoid suture, um, those are types of fibrous joints. They're connecting bones, but you can't move them at all. Um, and gomphoses, which are actually the joints that hold your teeth into your maxilla and into your mandible, those are all, those are all joints as well. Those shouldn't move, right? <laughs> yeah, no, let's not. Let's not think about that. That kind of grosses me out. But yeah, those show, should not move. Imagine if you can move your teeth. Ugh. Okay. All right. Let's talk about the types of synovial joints. Um, all right. So what we're going to get into here are the different motions that each kind of movable joint, a synovial joint, can produce. Um, the first type of synovial joint, the most famous one, it might be a ball and socket. There's a ball-shaped head of one bone that articulates with the socket of another. And if I had them on me right now, I would show you the ball and socket joint between the femur and the pelvis. All right, so one thing fits into the pelvis or the femur, the ball of the femur fits into the socket of the pelvis, and thus it creates a ball and socket joint. You can have a lot of different motions from this. You have four of them in your shoulders and in your hips as well. Okay, you have a particularly movable uh, ball and socket joint between your arm and your shoulder. You have a wide, wide range of motion 
uh, when it comes to that. Another type of joint is called condyloid. Uh, you have an, it's kind of similar to a ball and socket a little bit, but you have an oval-shaped condyle, an elliptical cavity, and it only moves in two axes. All right, so a condyloid joint, an example would be in your wrist. Okay, so I can, I can have a pretty wide range of motion in my wrist, but not like the ball and socket joint in my shoulder, right? I look kind of crazy right now. Okay, but this is called a condyloid joint in your wrist. All right, and in your phalanx, phalanges as well. Uh, check it out. I can do this with my finger. Okay, I have a fairly wide range of motion because of that condyloid joint as well. All right, uh, a plane joint. I don't have a picture of it, but a plane joint is two flat or slightly curved surfaces for sliding and twisting. Uh, various wrist and ankle bones are plane joints. So you got you got a lot of bones in your wrist and a lot of bones in your ankles, and some of them are just you know one flat surface to another, and that's it. And then they just slide. All right, um, another very famous type of joint is a hinge joint, as I am demonstrating right here. Okay, you have a convex and concave surface that allows for flexion, or that would be flexion and extension. All right, so your elbows, your knees, and your phalanges as well. Those are all hinge joints, and it's like, it's like a door, okay? The door is on a hinge. All right, moving on, a pivot joint um, is characterized by having a cylindrical surface with a ring of bone and ligament, and it allows for rotation. All right, so check it out. I have a pivot joint right here. Pronation and supination are possible because of the pivot joint in the radius. Uh, so your radius really just, uh, it just rotates, okay? That's a way I get everybody to remember which is which. The ro radius rotates around the axis of the ulna here. Um, so you can pronate and supinate. And your atlas and axis, which are your very top two vertebrae, C1 and C2, they have a pivot joint as well. And thank Thank goodness for that. You can pivot your head and rotate it around. All right, uh, a saddle joint is, well, it's in your thumb, between the metacarpal and carpal of your thumb. This is really the only main uh, saddle joint that we have. Um, but if you've got a convex and concave region, and you've got a variety of movements. So one, two, three, four, I declare, declare a thumb war. That's possible because of your, your saddle joint um, in your thumb. And here's a picture of it down here. All right, uh, it's really called a saddle joint because you got Something shaped like this, something shaped like this. You go, zoop, 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 and there's your saddle joint. Pretty sweet. All right, so let's talk about movements here. Flexion and extension. These are really, uh, these are really possible because of hinge joints. Flexion is decreasing the angle of a limb, bringing parts closer. Extension is increasing the angle of a limb and move, moving parts further apart. So here's flexion, here's extension. You can do that with me. Flexion, extension. Lovely. All right, uh, moving on from here. Adduction and abduction. Adduction is moving apart towards the midline, and abduction is moving apart away from the midline. Uh, the way I remember this, it's kind of weird, but you know, if you're abducted, you're taken away from where you were. So you're like, if you're abducting, you're moving your arm away from your torso. Okay, so let me demonstrate here. Adduction, moving apart towards the midline, like so. Okay, I'm moving my arm towards the midline, but abduction is moving it away. Yeah, and if that helps you remember, ab being abducted means you're taken away, then more power to you. All right, uh, rotation. I was doing this one before, moving apart around its axis. It's really only possible with a ball and socket joint, and not any, definitely not a hinge joint. Imagine if your elbow could rotate, that'd be, that'd be bad. Um, but yeah, rotation, and you can do this slightly rotation in your uh, ball and socket joint in your hip as well. So that's helpful. Uh, this is what I was demonstrating before, supination, rotation of the forearms of the palm is up, like so. This is uh, thank, thanks to the pivot joint in the radius. Okay, supination, palm is up, pronation, palm is down. Supination, pronation. Um, you may have heard of this before, but if you're lying in prone position, okay, it means your back is facing up, right? So prone, prone is like your palm facing up. I don't know. This might help you remember too. Hey, um, a few more. I don't know if I'll be able to demonstrate this on camera, but dorsiflexion is pointing your toes up or moving your toes closer to the shin. Okay, right? uh, yeah, I'm not going to demonstrate it. You can you can just look, watch the GIF, right? Um, and then plantar flexion or GIF. Uh, plantar flexion is moving toes further from the shin, so pointing them down. Pointing them up is dorsiflexion. Pointing them down is called plantar flexion. Maybe you can practice all these uh, on your own. 
All right, and I believe there's one more. Yep, there's one more emotion that I'd like to tell you about. Elevation, raising your shoulders, shrugging. Like, I don't know what elevation is. Um, raising your shoulders, and then depression is lowering your shoulders. All right, and you can see it from that gif right there that um, this is your, ooh, trapezius. Yeah, there we go. The trapezius is uh, really responsible for elevation and depression, moving your scapula up and down. All right. That's it. Let me know if you have any questions. Bye.